Finally, at long last, we have now reached part 4 of my 4 kids Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles recap series. We've discussed the highs of seasons 1 through 5, the lows of Fast Forward, and now it's time we take a look at the 7th and final season of the show, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Back to the Sewer. After the executive decision was made not to go through with a second season of Fast Forward, a couple of ideas were pitched around to Mirage Studios when trying to decide what direction the series would go next. These were ideas that sounded more concerned with the selling of toys rather than the quality of the story. One of these that really stood out to me was an idea called TMNT Super World, which would feature the inclusion of some sort of card game. It's just really funny to imagine Ninja Turtles chasing the success of Yu-Gi-Oh! as if the concept of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles just wasn't enough anymore. It's time to do 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 Although I will admit, I would gladly pick up some 4Kids Ninja Turtles trading cards if those were a thing, so long as the art was nice. There was another idea thrown around that involved the turtles meeting up with younger versions of themselves and just kind of hanging out or going on adventures with them throughout the season, which honestly sounds like a nightmare. Let's be glad that that never happened. The idea they eventually settled on is what we know as Back to the Sewer, a show that sees the turtles return to their present time, while occasionally shrinking themselves down and traveling through cyberspace in search of the missing pieces of Master Splinter. That's right, this show took the Tron route, and it's a deeply bizarre yet fascinating thing. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Despite wanting to distance itself from the previous season, the very first episode is, for the most part, a fast forward episode, even featuring the final use of the fast forward theme song. The episode begins with Cody and Donatello's completion of the teleportal as they prepare to return home. Unfortunately, Viral, who was last seen imprisoned inside of Serling, manages to escape and disrupts the time portal, causing the robot butler to get sucked in with them, and a crazy time travel adventure ensues. Not the first time the Turtles have had one of those in this continuity. This episode also fails to mention Darius Dunn, the main villain of Fast Forward, who is, to our knowledge, still at large in making up new schemes to overtake O'Neill Tech. His name is not mentioned once throughout this season, so you can just forget he ever existed, because our hero sure did. There's a lot going on in the chaotic first episode, it doesn't hold back. Episode 1 would also feature a few glimpses of things to come, such as characters that will be introduced throughout Back to the Sewer, and a potential future plotline involving a war between three shredders. It never happened. It never happened. It's an urban legend that never happened. Probably the very first thing you'll notice is how much the art style has changed between this season and Fast Forward. Back to the Sewer certainly has a toonier, bulkier look to it that a lot of people at the time weren't a fan of. I, however, quite like the way it looks. I don't feel the change was really necessary, but I don't mind it. To my understanding, it was still Dong Wu doing the animation. The most likely reason for this more stylized approach was so they didn't have to spend as much time and money on the animation itself. It really shows in the final product. I still think Back to the Sewer looks quite nice, but it's not nearly as fluent as those early seasons. After doing some Reddit research, if you can call it that, it seems the main reason for the change in design really had mostly to do with the 2007 movie, TMNT. If you're wondering my thoughts on that film, I quite enjoy it. Uh, not amazing, but pretty alright. People tend to argue whether or not it's canon to the 4 kids show, but in my mind it's very much its own thing. Now, I've never watched Jay's Reviews Ninja Turtles video, but a while back an animator by the name of Emilio Lopez commented on his review for the series. He stated that the toy company Playmates was still making toys based on the 2007 movie at the time, and had no desire to create two separate Turtles toy lines, so the production crew made the decision to change up the designs to more closely resemble those toys. This is why Back to the Sewer is the only season in which the turtles have pupils, something which is distracting at first, but you'll get used to it. 
It does make for some more expressive moments, which I thought was nice. The first episode ends with the turtles returning home along with Surly, who will spend the rest of the series wishing he was somewhere else. I refuse to spend another nanosecond trapped in this dreadful place with those green miscreants. Unfortunately, right before reaching their destination, Splinter gets zapped into a million pieces which are scattered throughout cyberspace. Viral then comes in contact with a mysterious data vault, displaying the Shredder's insignia. She touches it, transforming her into the new and improved Shredder, the Cyber Shredder. Don't laugh. The episode then ends on the brand new theme song, officially kicking off the new season. Oh shit, the theme song. I remember this came at a time when 4Kids was doing these song contests for their shows. A total of six potential opening themes were uploaded to their site as part of their Pick Us a Rockin' theme song before Mikey gets his way challenge. I don't recall any of the other songs, but I'm almost positive the theme they went with was the one that I voted for. But I'm sure those other songs were all enjoyable in their own right. I stand corrected. And I quite like the theme they went with. I don't think there was a single bad theme song throughout the entire 4Kids run. They were all bangers. Anyway, back to the plot. You may be asking yourself, who is this Cyber Shredder? What the shell is his deal? And it's really quite stupid. You're better off not knowing, but I'm going to explain it anyway. So basically, Cyber Shredder is a digital backup of the Utram Shredder created just in case anything should happen to him. But until the point that Viral came along, he was locked away inside a vault. Was he just gonna sit there until someone coincidentally traveled through cyberspace and awakened him? And why would he ever think to make a cyber version of himself, especially in a world where cloning technology exists? What were the chances the Turtles would one day have to travel inside the internet to rescue Master Splinter anyway? It just raises too many questions. Okay, so the Cyber Shredder stuff is convoluted and weird and stupid, but I do like his design. It's absolutely ridiculous, but I love the color scheme. Or maybe I'm just easily amused. I don't know. I think it's cool. Past the first episode, Back to the Sewer is a show that attempts to balance out what worked with the first five seasons while still introducing new ideas in hopes of keeping things fresh. The season is much more episodic. There is a bit of an overarching story with the cyberspace stuff, but the majority of episodes really stand on their own. The season constantly switches back and forth between more traditional New York City set episodes and the ones that take place almost entirely within the digital world. The second episode, Karate Schooled, really takes things back to basics. The Turtles get the chance to reunite with Casey and April, which is really nice to see. As a kid, it had felt like a much bigger deal, like something I'd been waiting years for, but maybe that's just a testament to how little I cared for Fast Forward. The episode revolves around Casey, who has taken up Karate School during the Turtles' year-long absence. But of course, his teacher, Master Khan, is actually using mind control on his students in order to build a new army of foot soldiers for the Shredder. I, I knew you would return. I have been rebuilding your army, my master. Preparing for this day! Khan is a character we'll be seeing a lot of this season. He's basically Hun, but a much lamer version. He has a neat design, but that's really all there is to him. Episode 3 is the first one in which the Turtles venture into cyberspace as Donatello is able to create a portal device that allows him and his brothers to transport themselves into the internet. I would say the idea of Donatello building such a device is implausible, but this is the same season I learned that Donatello has an IQ of 637. I feel useless. You got an IQ of 637, bro? More than double that of some of the highest IQs ever recorded, so never mind. This is all quite plausible. So much of the science jargon in this season is complete bullshit, though. 
Like, you can make any sentence sound science-y by adding reverse the polarity to it. So by reversing the polarity of the default stasis application, code should be able to be converted back into matter. You can really tell the writers were just making shit up, but what is writing if not making shit up? Donatello actually has more to do this time than any other season. You can really see the guilt that he feels for Splinter's disappearance, constantly blaming himself for what happened. Even though it's not really his fault, but he keeps telling us it is. This never should have happened in the first place. I was careless. I didn't think everything all the way through. I mean, this isn't the first time that their rat master has gone missing. In fact, I feel like it's a been there, done that sort of deal at this point in the series. But the real problem lies in Mikey, Raph, and most surprisingly, Leo seeming pretty okay with Splinter's absence. Like they're too busy catching up on all of the present day fun they missed out on to give a shit about any of life's worries. It's called Extreme Sports! Class dismissed! But hey, Hakuna Matata. I think a lot of that really has to do with the show's attempt at a lighter tone. They didn't want the show to get too weighed down in melodrama, and it makes sense. I just feel like it could have been handled in a better way. Cyberspace plays a major role this season. Your enjoyment of the Turtles' adventures in this location will greatly depend on whether or not you're already a fan of Tron. I found myself quite enjoying these episodes, which genuinely surprised me. I thought for sure the location would get tiresome after a while, but they always found a way to prevent that from happening. Of course, having the season consist of only 13 episodes does help. That and the fact that they do find ways to switch up the digital world and keep it from becoming too much of the same. Often throwing them into video games or virtual reality situations, which is one of those things I mentioned disliking about Fast Forward, but I didn't mind it here, and I really could not tell you why. I just found myself having more fun with these episodes, and I can't really pin it down to one particular reason. The cyber armor the turtles wear is extremely cool, at least to a nerd like me. It's actually extremely ironic that there were never any Playmates toys based on these designs. Another big plot point occurring throughout the season involves the wedding of Casey Jones and April O'Neil. It was honestly pretty cute seeing Casey propose in episode 4, and it felt like the right time in the series for such an event to occur. One of the things I do quite like about this season is that the character development feels present in subtle ways. It's hard to tell whether some of it is intentional or not, but it really does feel like these characters' most undesirable traits aren't as present this time around, or at least very toned down. I found Mikey to be far less irritating this time, especially when compared to his personality in Fast Forward. Are you okay, Lil Raffy? Did the bad birdie scare you? You are so cracked. From what I could tell, a lot of the same writers who worked on Fast Forward worked on this show too, so the change is a surprise, but a welcome one. Raphael is still a hothead, but even he feels more restraint this season. It's almost as if he's learned to control some of that rage. Nothing beats being surrounded by friends and family. See what I mean? Season 1 Raph would not have said that. Other past villains like Han and Baxter Stockman make their return. Although Bishop and Karai are both suspiciously absent throughout pretty much the entirety of this season, I'm sure the writers would have included them had more episodes been ordered. There simply just wasn't enough time. Hun is a lot of fun to see again. Greg Carey returns to voice him, and I like seeing him continue to be his own villain rather than just one of the Shredder's lackeys. There are plenty of episodes I enjoyed, but perhaps my favorite would have to be Super Quest, which is surprisingly one of the the turtles get sucked into a video game episodes. This one sees the turtles transported into Mikey's favorite MMORPG called Super Quest, which is very much World of Warcraft and D&D inspired. The turtles go there in search of Splinter's missing data bits, only to realize that if they want to retrieve them, they'll have to play by the game's rules. A lot of the appeal of this episode is just seeing Mikey geek out over the chance to experience one of his favorite games in real life. It's a pretty light-hearted, more comedic episode, but in a way that really fits the tone this particular season was aiming for. It's also not afraid to make a few jokes at gamers' expense, which I find pretty funny in an ironic sort of way. That's right, newbies, it's me, the ultimate gamer, and you have just been pwned! The ending of this episode includes possibly 
the biggest twist in the show's entire run, as we discovered that Hun himself is a gamer. That's right, I'm a hardcore gamer. Have been for years. Tell anyone and I'll rip your tongue out. And I'm sorry, but is that a motherfucking Jungle Emperor, aka Kimba the White Lion reference? No, but seriously, is it? I'm not sure if that's intentional or not. The later episodes of Back to the Sewer mostly revolve around the Cyber Shredder's failed attempts to physically manifest his cyber body into the real world. Every time he gets close to it, it seems the Turtles are easily able to thwart his plans. Despite being the big bad of the season and a supposedly stronger Shredder, he's far less intimidating than the Shredders of past seasons. The Justice Force also returned for a final superhero-focused episode titled Superpower Struggle, in which Raphael gets a hold of a green glowing cape that once belonged to a superhero called the Green Mantle. A hero that so closely resembles the Green Lantern that somebody should have sued. Of course, the episode revolves around Raphael being the newest Justice Force member and Michelangelo being jealous. At the end, they settle their differences and meet the original Green Mantle, giving the cape back to him. This wouldn't be the last appearance of the Justice Force as they do cameo in the series finale titled Wedding Bells and Bites. This episode focuses on the wedding of soon-to-be Casey and April Jones, but not before the last of Splinter's data bits are collected and he returns to the real world within the first two minutes. Alright, yeah! You were so worried! What a pair of liars! This is honestly one of the biggest letdowns in the entirety of the show. All that build up to an extremely unsatisfying payoff that's treated more like a plot inconvenience than anything worthy of note. I feel like such an important event should have at least been saved for the ending of the episode, but I understand they were likely being cut off from more, and at this point had to conclude the splinter and wedding arc all in one episode. For what it's worth, I don't absolutely hate this episode, it has a ton of problems, but it's kind of a nice attempt at closure for the series. It's a lot of fun seeing characters from previous seasons reunite, and using April and Casey's wedding as the backdrop is a neat idea. It does make this episode not as dramatic as it could have been, but at this point I think the series was far more concerned with maintaining that lighthearted tone they'd been utilizing since Fast Forward. The Cyber Shredder once again serves as the antagonist for this episode, managing to once again manifest the physical body in the real world. Did we fry you up extra crispy style? My body, perhaps, but the electric current you sought to destroy me with did not damage my digital core. Digital core? Oh, fuck off with this. You guys are just making up terms now. Shredder mentions being able to absorb a massive influx of energy, which explains why he is powerful enough to take on not just the turtles, but all their friends as well. His reign of terror is short-lived as Donatello, inside of Serling, manages to hit him with a decompiling beam, the same one used to defeat Viral. And thus, the day is saved once again. Okay, so the last episode is rough. It's clearly a rushed finale in an attempt to rapidly tie up all the loose ends from the season's earlier events. Even then, not everything gets a satisfying conclusion, or should I say, a conclusion, as Serling is still stuck in the present with the Turtles. Which is pretty messed up when you consider that Serling is basically Cody's father figure and now all he has in the future is his uncle Darius, who should really be in prison. Despite the belief that Wedding Bells and Bites is the final episode of the season, there was actually one more piece of Back to the Sword media that was exclusive to the website. I'm talking about the Mayhem from Mutant Island shorts, which featured 13 chapters that, when put together, measures to about 18 minutes, almost the length of a regular episode. These shorts are much more focused on action spectacle than telling a riveting story, which is ironic because just look at that quality. I'm sure they had to compress it a bunch for their website, and at least it's not lost, but it doesn't look too great. The outfits the turtles wear actually tie into the sub-sewer outfits made for the TMNT line. 
Which makes a lot of sense. You can really feel the buy our toys energy radiating off of these shorts. These babies sure be packing a parachute. No! In conclusion, Back to the Sewer is a season that gets a lot of hate. Even at its time of release, views were at an all-time low for the show, and the critical reception most certainly wasn't in its favor. It's easy for me to see why people weren't fond of this season, for many obvious reasons, but if I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I quite enjoyed it. Is it as strong as the first five seasons? No. But is it better than Fast Forward? Some may disagree with me, but I would say absolutely. It's a season much more concerned with telling these fun little standalone stories, and I think those are the episodes that work best. The show is at its weakest when it's trying to tell any sort of overarching narrative, which is ironic as that was one of the show's greatest strengths in the beginning, but I'm okay with that. I enjoy these fun little adventures set in the world of the Turtles, and I tend to be far more accepting of these episodic, filler-filled TV shows than most people seem to be in this day and age. Overall, I think Back to the Sewer ran into a lot of the same problems as any other show that overstayed its welcome. All of their creativity had already been used up, and they were just kind of delaying the inevitable, fighting against a network that was slowly killing any chance of success. And while it is a bit sad seeing this series come to an end for the second time in my life, Back to the Sewer was, surprisingly, not the true conclusion to the four kids' run. Nope, the real conclusion was a movie titled Turtles Forever, a movie I plan to cover in the near future. Next Saturday morning, Turtle Power! It's a special world premiere exclusive, and I got the pizzas. We're good to go. So many turtles, we had to make a movie just to fit them all in. So please, bear with me just a bit longer while I spend the next few months assembling my fifth and final video, taking a look at the exciting conclusion to 4Kids Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I hope to see you there.